Good Wednesday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. Today we look at Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where the Bible says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, and then committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And just like on Monday, we start out with a connecting phrase, for this reason. Well, for what reason? Well, the reason is, is because humans have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and because humans have exchanged the truth about God for a lie and have worshiped and served the creature rather than creator. Remember, the fundamental sin of all sin that Paul makes very clear here in Romans chapter 1 is the sin of idolatry. It's the sin of taking something that is not God and making it the God of your life. And for this reason, again, God gives them up. Now, we pointed out that there are three times in the text where the Bible says God gives them up. God gives them up to hearts, to impurity. God gives them up to dishonorable passions. God gives them up to a debased mind. And here it is. God gives them up to dishonorable passions, the second one of the three. And in doing so, when God gives them up to dishonorable passions, it leads to a certain behavior that Paul wants to talk about. And here he starts by saying their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The exchange that occurs here, it's, it's one of three exchanges we looked at on Monday. The exchange that occurs here is exchanging the truth of God for a lie. It's exchanging the created order for something that is contrary to the created order. And that's what happens when God gives us up because of our willful rebellion and our commitment to idolatry. Now, I want to say something at the outset. This text here is talking very specifically about certain types of behaviors. It is not talking about temptation to sin. Someone says here, well, I'm, I'm a person who is same-sex attracted, although I have chosen to live a life of celibacy. That is not what's being talked about here. This is talking about people who have committed the sin of same-sex activity, not same-sex attraction. So we got to be very clear here. This is not Paul talking about some form of temptation that we can successfully fight and resist. Paul is talking here about the act of two men or two women committing fornication one with the other. Don't impose upon Paul modern concepts and categories. The idea of gender and sexuality spectrum were not in his vocabulary. Paul is referring to the literal intercourse that occurs between two men or between two women. And that is the sin up for consideration right here. Now, we need to understand the context. What is Paul saying in this context? And not only in the text, but in his historical context. Well, Paul is standing well within the Jewish view of the world. What Paul is saying here is in no way controversial to any Jew of the first century. This was orthodox. This was accepted by any follower of the Old Testament. And we'll, we'll point that out by looking at several quotations that are roughly contemporary to Paul's time. Jews famously rejected homosexual sin, that is intercourse between two men, fornication between two men or two women, in a face of a pagan world that practiced it regularly. And one quotation comes from the letter of Aristeos. The letter of Aristeos. And here's what it says in, in 151 and 152. Therefore, he compels us to recognize that we must perform all our actions with discrimination according to the standard of righteousness, more especially because we have been distinctly, this is about the Jews, we Jews have been distinctly separated from the rest of mankind. For most other men defile themselves by promiscuous intercourse, thereby working great iniquity, and whole countries and cities pride themselves upon such vices. For they not only have intercourse with men, but they defile their own mothers and even their own daughters. But we have been kept separate from such sins. The Jews of Paul's day were separated from the sins of the pagan world. In fact, this was a great marker of distinction. They looked upon themselves and said, we had the law of Moses and we have kept ourselves from these vile forms of, of sexual morality, including incest, including same-sex activity, that is for men and women to commit fornication one with the other. 
and the Jews kept themselves distinct. And so when Paul talks about this, again, this is a non-controversial statement in his day. Maybe it's controversial today, but it was not controversial for Paul to say this in any way. Also, we have to understand that Jews and Christians both recognized homosexuality as a particular form of rebellion against the created order. And that's the question really we need to really focus in on. Of all of the sins that Paul could call attention to, why does he single out this sin? Why does he single out the sin of men committing fornication one with another or of women committing fornication one with another? In fact, it's become very in vogue to say, well, homosexuality not, not same-sex attractiveness. Again, I want to make that clear. We're not talking about men who have the temptation or women who have the temptation towards same-sex sin. We're talking about the actual act of men and women committing fornication with themselves. It's been very in vogue to say, well, that's just one of many sexual sins that people commit. It's like a boyfriend and a girlfriend committing fornication. And there is a sense in which that is true. Sin is sin against God, and that sin can take various shapes and sizes. But Paul still has a reason for calling out this sin in particular, and the reason he wants to call it out is its relation to the created order or the fact that it stands as contrary to nature. And that is not something Paul made up. That was not a unique idea to him. Consider Philo in his writing Philo on Abraham in 137. He says, but God, having taken pity on mankind as being a savior and full of love for mankind, increased as far as possible the natural desire of men and women for a connection together for the sake of of producing children. Now, this is in the context where Philo is talking about homosexual fornication. He says it's become so commonplace among the pagan world. That's why God in his mercy increased as far as possible the natural desire for a man and a woman to be together to offset the fact that the sin of homosexual fornication had become so commonplace and so prevalent for the sake of producing children. He increased that desire. And notice his language, the natural desire for men. To say that for men and women to be together was the natural course of things, that is to say it accords with the created order, was something that Jews of Paul's day accepted without reservation. Again, Philo in his writings, The Special Laws, in, in 50, he says, but lusting unnaturally, contrary to nature, lusting unnaturally and seeking to deface the manly character of the nature of man and to change it into a woman-like appearance for the sake of the gratification of his own polluted and accursed passions. Very similar language here. It is dishonorable passions that have caused men to abandon the nature of men contrary to nature and to defile it and to turn themselves into a woman-like appearance. After Paul's time, Clement of Alexandria, the Christian writer, says this. He says, men play the part of women and women that of men contrary to nature. Women are at once wives and husbands. This is a very clear statement from Clement, a Christian, showing that in his day, they understood that for men and for women to be together was the natural course of things, and for men and men to commit fornication and for women and women to commit fornication was, in fact, contrary to nature. Now, we know from the Old Testament, from the book of Leviticus, that it is a sin for a man to lie with another man as if he were lying with a woman. And this language that Paul is using, again, is not at all controversial in their day. So the question again arises, why bring it up? Why this sin? Why not talk about dishonesty or injustice or hatred, as Paul talks about in other places? Well, the reason that Paul wants to call attention to this sin is he wants to draw our attention to the created order. To the created order. And I want you to think for a moment about Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, where the Bible says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The male-female dichotomy is a fundamental part of the created order. In fact, it is a part of image bearing itself. If you look at the Hebrew parallelism, God made man in his own image. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means many things, but a part of what it means is God created them male and female. Now, the sin of idolatry is to reject God's image and to replace it with man's image. That's the sin of idolatry. We're made in God's image. We should be looking to God's glory and reflecting what it means for God's image to be 
within us as his image bearers, as men and as women, as male and female. But when we reject God's image and we start looking at our own image, we prop up the mirror, this male and female dichotomy goes away and becomes secondary. And so you can see why Paul calls attention to this sin in particular, because this sin in particular, it strikes at the very core of what it means to be made in God's image and to live our lives in accord with their created order. That is not to say that this sin is somehow unforgivable or that it's somehow worse in the long run than other forms of sexual sin. That's not Paul's point. But Paul's point does say that this sin in a very real way shows us how humans have so rejected God and rejected his created design, and we have chosen to act contrary to nature. Women exchanging the natural relations for other women. Men exchanging the natural relations for other men, being consumed with passion or dishonorable passions, committing, he says, shameless acts and receiving the due penalty for their error. Remember, this sin is not the cause of God's wrath. It is the product of God's wrath. The sin that brings God's wrath is idolatry. And when God gives us over, when God releases the reins, we all of a sudden start taking apart and destroying what it means to be made in the image of God. You may wonder, why are Christians so vehement in their defense of traditional marriage, as people often say? I I would rather say this. Christians are so vehement in their defense for what it means to be made in the image of God. And we understand that when we no longer acknowledge God's created order in men and women forming families, getting married, and having children, when we no longer acknowledge that, we understand that we are further committing the sin of idolatry, and we are striking at the very heart of what it means to be an image bearer. Thank you for joining us today on Beginning the Word. It's my hope. That just as you have begun today in the word of God, you will live out today in the word of God.